We're going to call our annual meeting to order, just to try to respect everybody's time and people that have joined us online and have joined us in person. Yeah, welcome to our Washington Central Annual Meeting. Hope you can, can you hear me okay? All right, I'm going to try to do my best to project my voice and sort of look at both the screen and the people here. I like to start by acknowledging that we are fortunate in Washington Central to have really caring staff, really caring community members that are here. And by staff, I mean everybody from you know our bus drivers to our administrators, our teachers. It, we're really fortunate to have a community that really cares about the future of our kids. So as we get started in this conversation of our budget this evening, I want us all to think about the consequences of today into tomorrow. What we do here tonight matters. How we show up here matters. Even the challenges that we have faced and overcome, and I know a lot of you guys know this because I've been part of that over the years. I believe we, can, we are capable, capable of overcoming any obstacles, not only for this current budget season, but for the future of making our district as um, a sustainable school district. I wanted to remind us that it takes all of us. Uh, let us model for our younger generation civility, kindness, uh, be curious, listen for understanding, and uh, um, greatness, like they say, is usually what we do for others, not what we do for ourselves. So I want to read a little quote in about you know why we care about public education, why we care about uh, what we do here as a school board and, and as our administrators. In every interaction, we must remind people that public schools were created to take our to make our democracy a reality. For centuries, they have been indispensable in creating the most free, creative, and powerful country on the planet and they remain the principal mechanisms through which this nation makes good on its found fundamental promise of liberty, justice, and opportunity for all. Every path to individual community and national success runs through those wide open doors in each of our community schools, uh, and we can't do it alone. We need you. Uh, so I'm excited for all of us to be joined here together and for the opportunity that we have to have a conversation with you. I know this has been a challenging time, but let's, let's get started. Uh, welcome, Joshua. So we're going to get started right with, the, we're going to have a brief presentation, but let's move right to the next. Could you say what your name and role is? Oh, sorry. Uh, my name is Flor Diaz-Smith. I'm the chair of the board. And I guess let's go around and introduce ourselves. Sure. Uh, Mm -hmm. I, I'm Megan Roy, I'm the superintendent. I'm Suzanne Gann, the business administrator for the district. Ursula Stanley, board, board member um, from Middlesex. Amelia Contrada, board member from East Montpelier. Zach Sullivan, board member from East Montpelier. I'm Daniel Keeney, I'm a board member from Callis. I'm McKaylin LeClaire, board member from Worcester. And I'm Chris McBay, board member from Middlesex. Josh Savitz, sorry, late board member from Middlesex. We also have a few board members online. I, I might just call on them when I see them. <laughs> yeah. So, Kari. Hi, everybody. I'm the uh, board vice chair of the Calis. Natasha. Hello, Natasha Eckhart uh, from Worcester. And Diane. Hi, Diane Nichols Fleming, board member from Berglin. Great. I think that's all of us. Okay. So, Mark, can we? Uh, yeah. Oh, you got the slides. Got okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we we wanted to do a quick overview of uh, how we got started. Sorry, I got muted. There you go. Okay. So we've been working really hard as a board to try to be uh, do round year budgeting. This is when. We've been talking about this is when we started the budget uh, development timeline here, October 18th. I'm not going to read through the whole timeline, but this is where we are. Right now, we adopted a budget on January 17th that we had to really quickly change in February. But today, we, uh, March 4th is our annual meeting, and March 5th, as you know, is the town day, is our voting day. We move to the next slide. Uh, the agenda for tonight is just to give uh, you know what is happening in Vermont that takes this that makes this year challenging. We'll cover a little bit of that, uh, the vision and core values, and what do our schools need 
in order to support our students. And then we're going to talk briefly at the end on the configuration study that the Finance Committee, the Expanded Finance Committee is being working on and how can we configure our schools to achieve our vision of sustainability. And we are also, of course, going to go over uh, what is the cost to provide uh, this to our students. Uh, I know that some of you had joined us for some of for some of this work, but not everybody uh, came to, to the meeting. So we will leave room for, for questions at the end. We're going to try to make this presentation as brief as possible, but we want you to all have the same information before we get started. Okay, next. Uh, what the, the context realities for, for this year budget, as, as you know, is the sunset of the ESSER funds. Uh, you know, what are the ESSER funds? Those were the federal uh, grant imp grants that we received in the, during the pandemic. They all sunset in September of 2024. So that is a big uh, uh, context in our reality for, for this year. The rising uh, cost of labor, healthcare, and construction cost. It changes in the Vermont education funding increasingly uh, connects funding to enrollment. And our enrollment, and we'll look at some graphs later, is definitely declining. Uh, Act 173, which is the, has decreased the special education funding. It's made it more flexible, but it has decreased uh, some of the funding. And Act 127, uh, the long-term weighted average daily membership has changed how, instead of equalized pupils, we now have a long-term weighted average of daily membership. The budget realities. We can debate whether uh, there were unforeseen impl implications or not, but the reality is that the entire state discovered enormous tax rate implications in the middle of, uh, of uh, this budgeting season. Uh, the cost drivers that we just talked about uh, not impacted just us, but impacted everybody in the state. Uh, the transition mechanism that originally Act 127 had was a cap of 5%. So let's say we were at 9.87, but we were capped at 5%, right? So that was the reality that we were budgeting with. Once the cap uh, went away, we were in a different reality. So not just that, but the impacted property yield resulted in, resulted in significant increases in property taxes. Our CLA at, at our, our district, the so common level of appraiser, our houses, there's not enough housing in our state, not just in our Washington central area. Our houses are selling higher but we haven't kept up. We are due for an reappraisal. Re 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 <laughs> so that's another factor. The General Assembly, in its attempt to address all of this, right, created at the last minute a, a, a 850, which removed the cap. But basically, they had to do it because we, they, you know, there was no other option because they, we were, what would be, I'm gonna, Jump into you. We were gonna. I just don't want to get too much into what why H uh, 850 because it's not something that we can control. But but it happened. But I think it would help if we give them a little context. You might jump in, in Megan. Yeah, I think the, what we're trying to point out is unlike most budget years, there were changes made to our projections very very late in the game, and that is different than normal. You build your budget based on assumptions that were given on December 1st, typically, and that's what this board did and adopted a budget that assumed those. The state needed to react, the General Assembly felt it needed to react to sort of widespread increases. This was their solution. Um, and it changed our conversation after the budget had been adopted. And that's really the highlights. Later, if people have questions about H850 and what it means and some of the mechanics, happy to get to those. The most important piece is that last bullet, though. We do not benefit from any sort of incentive or um, protection in the new law because we gained in long-term weighted average daily pupils. So we benefited from Act 127, and therefore we are not eligible for any sort of property One tax cent. Yeah. Um, protections. So that's what I would have you yeah. keep in mind. And I, yeah, and we're... Do you want to... Uh, if we can yes, hold, questions, hold questions, if that's okay. Yeah, we'll hold questions to the end and we'll have a space for questions and, and comments. Yeah. 
Yeah, let's do the next slide. And we promise to be quick. This just, because I know a lot of you guys are familiar with this, but the total enrollment for our district, I'm not going to read through the entire graph, but if we stay in the current enrollment, you can see that the entire district is 1428 students right now. So from year 2022 to now, or even from last year, we're losing students. If we go to the next yeah slide gives you the same picture with a different with a different model but you can see what we're projecting for year 26 again is 1326 I keep changing that number is 1320 is 1420 1320 and I keep saying 1326 but you can see that our district the our um, enrollment is declining and we've been seeing this as a trend over the years, so this is not news to most community members. Then we're going to get now into the why. You know, why is why we do what we do as a school board here, and what what is the story we tell with our with our budget? So all year we have been working on our core beliefs. We have been engaging with the community members in what what is it that the community cares and. Why do we exist? We're keeping our same mission, but we came, didn't come up with input from community members, from, from staff, from students. We came up, we developed these five core beliefs, humanity and justice, community and belonging, well-being, transparent and responsible leadership, which is the governance, where you're here, community engagement and relationships, and rigorous curriculum and instruction. And and so with this, we're in the middle of the strategic planning process and, uh, well, actually, we're at the end of the strategic planning process. So we, we're starting to create uh, action steps and through this deep community involvement uh, for almost a year, like I was saying, uh, we have identified the core beliefs that we just talked about. And that defines what we are committed as a community, not just what the school board is committed or where the students are committed, it's what we are committed and what we want to support with this, with this budget. Uh, what we have been using over the past uh, two years uh, is these three pillars to, to also frame uh, our budget. Uh, so we bring, if we bring the core beliefs into uh, grain size, uh, we, we have focused on academic achievement, safe and healthy schools, and humanity and justice. What does academic achievement mean? And I know that MLLS is just another term that we put there, but it's multi-layer system of supports. It's how we, how we make sure that we give first instruction. What is that? First instruction is that we make sure that our teachers, it, uh, the everyday teacher in the classroom can meet 80% of the student needs. And from that, it's you know multi, uh, a layer two where they can do interventions, et cetera. We're not going to get into that. But so we, that is, we have seen results on that. So we want to make sure that this budget supports that. And safe and healthy schools, the social and emotional learning, and district safety is, is something that we know our kids need. You know, the mental health needs are, are huge right now. And this is a very, it, we're, we're committed to that to make sure that we're not just, the, that we're meeting our students. It needs and that we are keeping up with professional devel development and uh, the staffing resources that we need in order to support these three pillars. And then with humanity and justice, it, we've been working on equity. Uh, thanks to Megan, we have a way to monitor a little bit better now our equity indicators and our humanity and justice coalition has been doing a lot of work to make sure that you know our kids feel like they belong and that they can they're, they're ready to learn when they go through our doors and they feel like they belong in our schools. Yeah. This last slide that I'm going to take is the, our engagement uh, timeline. You know, uh, what are our priorities, right? What does AOE requires? What uh, Act 173 that we keep talking about in the special education? Uh, the board wanted to focus on the, the achievement gap. We created a goal for that, and as we talked just a brief minute ago, uh, we identified those three three pillars, which is not just us that use it, but staff uses. The staff and the community, you can see the timeline there. I don't need to read it to you, but we were engaging meaningful input <laughs> from, from a community. And with that, our, my last slide is really the budget parameters. This is something that we started back in September. Like I was saying, we were committed for year 
around budgeting. And what we said was we further development of multi-layer system of supports, support accelerated growth for our students from historically marginalized uh, identities, which and what really means is like supporting those students uh, that have been that we know that have been struggling for a long time. Uh, supporting our three pillars: academic achievement, safe and safety, uh, safe and healthy schools, humanity and justice, and support investment in school security. And why school security is not just because we we believe it's important, but also because there was legislature that passed legislation that passed that made we needed to commit money to that. Uh, we also <coughs> wanted to work considering configuration changes that realizes program quality improvements and remain under the Act 127 per pupil spending threshold to avoid a tax rate review. At that point, it was a 10% that all went away, so this parameter doesn't even count anymore. Uh, frame a budget decision around education quality <coughs> standards and equitable distribution of resources. This is what we do to provide uh, guidance for our administrators, right? We don't get into allocating money. We, as a board, set guidelines for them to allocate how they're going to meet, not just meet the student uh, needs, but also provide opportunities for our students. And with that, I'm going to pass it on mm -hmm. to Megan. Perfect. Thank you, Floor. Um, so again, our job as a leadership team is to take all of the input and the conversation from the board and this direction that the board has given us and bring them a budget that we believe um, will support our mission, vision, the work of the schools within this context. And I just would highlight um, the reason that net impact under the October inflation rate was removed is because that was direction given to us in September until we realized exactly how much costs were inflated. Um, and to bring our net impact under that would have been, would have required significant reductions. So the administration takes those, uh, these three areas that the board asked us, these lenses. Um, we grounded our conversation in education quality, um, in the distribution of resources. Are all of our schools receiving the resources they need to serve the share of students they have? And also take into account student need. So when we began this work, um, we knew that we would have to be proposing reductions. That, that was very clear in this budget process. We were not um, going to be able to bring in a budget with um, increased spending. Um, so in order to approach that as a leadership team, we wanted to prioritize our ability to achieve our vision within our current configuration. We are configured <laughs> the way we are, and we will be at least for the coming budget year. And we took that as um, understanding that context. Uh, we needed to make sure our staffing was consistent with education quality standards. That is both the board's direction and also um, state law. And then we wanted to make sure that we allowed individual schools to make recommendations based on their current instructional needs. And that began by saying, we know we have revenue loss through the loss of grant funding and that we have to respond to enrollment changes. So all of our schools have fewer, serve fewer students and lost funds, but we wanted each school to be able to propose what they believed was necessary. And so the next several slides, um, in a second I'm gonna turn it over to Suzanne around the numbers, um, but we wanna talk with folks about what the changes are in this budget. And again, those of you that have been with us through this process have seen this, um, but some of you have not. This is a summary slide that just talks about the um, changes across the district. I'm going to go through some slides that show you exactly where those are. You will see there are increases to this budget. There are positions that we believe were necessary to meet the needs of our students. Um, and we knew that in order to achieve those, we would need to offset those ads. So I'm not going to spend much time on that summary slide. <coughs> the next several slides will just talk about what those um, changes to the budget are. Um, this first slide, in fact the first two, these are changes that we would make regardless of whether or not they realized savings. And that is because the enrollment in pre-K and kindergarten between Worcester and Middlesex is so small that it does not allow for quality class sizes. So we knew we needed to merge those two programs. So for pre-K, um, we are merging a single program. Um, it is going to be housed at Rumney for next year. 
Um, this allows us to provide more consistent sessions and have before and after care for, for pre-K students. So again, this we would have done regardless, but we will be able to realize a partial uh, reduction in support staff for that change. Same with um, kindergarten, the projected uh, enrollment is seven and six respectively. So together, even together, that is a pretty small kindergarten size, but 13 is, um, is good instructional size, seven and six are not. Um, this will be housed at Doty for the coming school year. And this does realize a reduction of a classroom teacher. Across the next two slides, they're just going to summarize the um, decreases. In Berlin, uh, there's an enrollment related reduction of a classroom teacher, a reduction of a school counselor, an ESSER funded school counselor, and an addition of a board certified behavior analyst. That's what BCBA stands for, and that is someone to provide. Um, support to the social emotional learning system. Part of that is funded through Project Serve, which is grant money associated with the flooding in July because Berlin was particularly impacted. At East Montpelier, there's a reduction related to enrollment of a classroom teacher. Um, in Callis, their reductions are also largely ESSER reductions. So these are positions that were uh, funded through the um, the ESSER grant. And I should say, as I'm looking at this slide, um, the board did make a decision at the end of the budget season to maintain full-time nursing and counseling. And so the reductions that you see in Callis and Doty, we did not update that slide. In Rumney, the reduction is in the area of para-educators and also a school-wide behavior professional. That was, again, a grant-related reduction because of a loss of funding. And at U32, there's a reduction of an ESSER-funded school counselor and an add of an SAP counselor, that's Student Assistance Program, uh, someone who can work with the student body on substance use and prevention. And that is partially funded through a grant. Uh, U32 is also re re reducing in the area of paraeducators. So that's a lot of information, but again, this is just summarizing what the changes are in the budget. Um, actually, let me go back a slide. This does represent significant reductions um, in this proposed budget. This is a chart that has a lot of information in it, but this is just to let folks know that even with the reductions that we have made, we are still well within Vermont's education quality standards, which is something we're both required to do and we believe is the right thing. And so it, we think it's just important to make sure people know that, yes, we are reducing staff and we are still well within our ed quality standard. And I think this is where I turn it to Suzanne. Mm -hmm. uh, so over the course of this, we've uh, had this slide in here for some definitions. And so we won't go over it a whole lot. It's really in here for reference on the long-term weighted average daily membership the common level of appraisal, and the property yield. Uh, you'll see that a combined uh, increase in expenditures of 12.5%, a decrease in revenues of 3.15%, resulted in a net ed spending of uh, increase of 16.14%. The long-term weighted average daily membership, or LTWADM, provided by the AOE is an increase of 8.8% from 2,184.51 to 2376.88. And the local spending per pupil is a 6.7% increase over FY24 uh, from 14,510 to 15,488 using the, the long-term weighted average daily membership numbers. And I would just jump in because it's important for people to realize we did not gain students. We continue to lose students. What has changed is how those students are weighted, which is part of how Vermont funds education. So I just want to make sure that's clear. And in order to calculate tax rates, they recalculated this year's membership or last year's, year's membership to compare our current spending. So. That can feel confusing because a few slides ago we showed a slide that said we have about 
1,400 students, and that is what we have in chairs in school. Um, this is a different thing. So the equalized homestead tax rate is the rate that a district would have for resident homes if all properties were assessed at fair market value. The equalized tax rate is divided by the common level of appraisal, or the CLA, to develop the individual town tax rate. All five of our towns in the district saw a drop in their CLA, which ranged between 6.37% in Worcester and 13.67% in Berlin. The CLA decreases mean tax rate increases in each of those towns. So here we have the estimated equalized homestead tax rate. Uh, for this budget, it was calculated using the property yield from February 8th, which was uh, provided by the AOE as a potential $9,769. We have seen this number uh, vacillate extremely throughout this process, but that's where we landed on February 8th. Uh, this results in an equalized uh, tax rate of 1.5855. This number is divided by the CLA and results in the estimated property taxes for each town illustrated by this table. Uh, this slide illustrates the estimated tax increase that homestead property owners would see in each town based on homes valued at $100,000, $200,000, and $300,000 using the equalized tax rate of 1.5855. So we know the state's final property yield will likely change before the legislative session is over. Throughout this budget development process, we've encouraged the board to focus on what they can control, which is the net expense budget. We provide this information to the board to help connect the tax rate projections to the budget that needs to be warned or that was warned for town meeting day. Okay, so I'm going to um, finish us off and then we'll have time for questions um, by sharing a little bit of the board's conversation around configuration because as we shared earlier this budget is built um, based on running six schools the way that we do currently run them um, and that is partially uh, why the costs look like they they do um, this is not a new conversation for this board. Um, in fact, this is not a new conversation for this district and long preceded both Suzanne and I and um, several members of the team. But this year, um, we wanted to kind of walk us back the last two years. So we knew that if before we were gonna have a conversation about how we should be structured, we needed to know what it is our schools are trying to achieve. And if we didn't ground this conversation in what do we want for students, then we're just sort of moving chess pieces. We're not talking about what is it we want for kids. So last year focused on the strategic planning process, which Floor talked about at the beginning. And that is not quite finalized and adopted, but we're coming pretty close to the end of that process. What we do have is our vision and core beliefs, which is sort of the most important piece to be able to ground this conversation in. In August, the board decided to do this work by charging the Finance Committee with studying it and presenting recommendations to the board. They also made sure the Finance Committee had representation from all of our towns. Um, yeah, there's a few bullets in here that just talks about what we did. Um, if folks are interested, all of this information is on our website um, under the um, board committee section. Um, they looked at enrollment data. and focused on what some options might be. The full board received, a, um, at, at first, we were operating off this idea that we would have uh, options presented in December, that we would spend January on engaging the community um, and aiming for a June decision. Um, what I would say is that that timeline's revised a little bit because the uh, rightfully the finance committee wants the full board to engage in this conversation and have a deeper discussion about how we then engage the community. Um, there will be a full presentation of configuration simulations on April 3rd. 
But again, another way of looking at it is in order to know how we should be configured, we need to ground that in our core beliefs, we need to study different ways to organize ourselves, and we need to deeply engage our community, and the board is committed to this process. This we thought was important to remind people of. We are not at this meeting presenting configuration options. That is something the full board has not have it, had an opportunity to look at. But we want the community to know that this is part of the conversation because it is related to budget. Um, but one of the things that we have come to in the study of this is the goal of our structure is to have high quality enriching instruction for all students and sometimes the structure that we, in some ways, the structure that we have now limits the ability to do that. Um, so this is a conversation about what's best for students in our communities, not just a um, cost containment conversation. So we know, based on the work of the um, Board and Finance Committee, that we want class sizes that meet education quality standards and are sufficient to provide rich instruction, meaning they need to be big enough to provide rich instruction. We don't meet that in all of our schools. We know we want full-time nursing and counseling in our buildings. We know we want to maintain or expand enrichment opportunities. We have inconsistency in our district now because some of our schools are too small to offer some of the opportunities that um, other schools in the district have. We also know from a workforce standpoint that we want to limit or eliminate shared positions across schools or really small FTE, and that's because we have great teachers and great staff and we want to keep them. Um, and it's hard to do that when over time you shave that off. The board also um, heard quite a bit about um, the concept of a middle level program for grades six through eight instead of seven, eight, which is who currently um, attends middle school here at U32. Um, because again, that will achieve a quality middle, middle school experience. So they did ask us to prioritize that model and model several, several options that include fewer than five elementary schools. So again, that is just so that the community and those listening um, understand that this is an ongoing um, part of the board's work. So um, if we can, yeah, we can stay on that slide for a oh. minute. So part of the reason we're not sharing that, like Megan said, is because the board as a whole hasn't had a chance to look at it, but also because the main purpose of the configuration study committee right now is to be able to come early on to the community and get engage the community meaningfully because we know if we don't engage you meaningfully we won't have you we won't earn your trust you won't support the change and then the change won't be able to to be a reality for our communities right especially if it involves closing a school right and we have articles of agreement so it's that is one of the reasons we couldn't make that just happen really quickly. We are committed to deep community engagement to make sure that this, this system change, it would uh, be there for, for years to come and benefit all of our students. So with that, the last slide is just also to remind <coughs> you to, uh, to pick up you know, your ballots for the career center. You know, please vote uh, for uh, vote tomorrow uh, and also to don't forget if you voted absentee the career the career center ballots were not mailed to you unless you requested a ballot so don't forget to vote in career center the budget uh, for the career the amount of money that it's shown there for career center is already in our budget so it is not like you're adding more uh, money in, if you're voting for the career center separately. It's just now it's a separate career district, but it's already embedded in our uh, tuition. Are you saying there's a separate vote ballot that we're supposed to be voting on that? that yes. In the mail? Yeah, that doesn't yeah, come in the, the that, yes, yeah, and that was yeah. the same last year. This is the second year of the career center, and the reason for that is because we would need the 18 towns to agree to make, right now for us, we get six towns to agree, and we go around for six towns to agree to mail the ballots. We will need to get the 18 towns that, that make the six sending districts to agree to mail the ballots. And it's a bit challenging. So with that, uh, we would open it up uh, to, to questions. But I want to say uh, we're going to want to have people online raise their hands. Uh, no. Nope. Oh, sorry. Put it in the but, chat. Put it on the chat. Sorry, I forgot about that. We talked about this this morning because we want to make sure that we open it for questions separately from comments, right? So. If you have a question, put it in the chat. Megan is going to help me monitor mm -hmm. the, the, the chat. Uh, and we will, get, uh, we will alternate between 
people in the room, with people in the on, online. Uh, and then after that, uh, once questions have been answered, we will take comments from, uh, from both the online, uh, people joining us online and people joining us uh, here. And we'll do the best we can, so please, uh, let's get started. Are there any questions from here? I have a question. Yeah, and then identify yourself for us. Jane Burroughs, yeah. um, I'm the Mason Failure. And this is more of a bigger, overall general question versus specific. You presented on the timeline that you guys start the budget in October. Yeah. And start finding that we've got crises happening to try to do this budget. Is there any, we knew the numbers were going well years ago. We knew that the COVID money was just going to be isolated. Is there any pre-budget process to say, hey guys, I know we started the budget in October, but does nobody look at that crisis mode until it becomes a crisis? Like back when, hey, we're going to have a problem in three or four years, the numbers going to be low. Is that happening? Or is that everything just like October 1st, crisis mode, we don't have the money, now what do we do? And the decision I made is like, okay, what do we, we find this with COVID, are we going to be able to continue it? Do we want to fund this? That's my biggest thing, because we've known the numbers are going down. Is there any pre-thought, like, hey, three years from now, yeah, so like we're in crisis mode. Yeah, and I'm not going to attempt to answer all the questions myself because we have other board members here that can also uh, can also jump in. But what I what I would say to that, Jen, is that we we are looking further ahead. Uh, part of the reason of moving into year round budgeting is not being in you know being a firefighter and every time there's that fire, then we react. No, the whole point of why we're talking about strategic planning, why we're talking about the configuration study, is to create a system. We were been moving slowly since we. Uh, had since past Act 46, right? We've been small, moving slowly as communities into creating a system, not a system of uh, one school system instead of several schools. So it, it just it takes time. But two years ago, we presented we need to buy in both from the community and from all, we are a diverse board, right? We have diverse opinions. We have, and that's what makes it not just fun, but what it represents our communities. There's a diversity of thought among our board members, and we need, you know, we need to get more community engagement. We were getting community engagement. What has been happening so far is the feedback that we have been getting and what you see here on, on the board. And I don't mean that as an excuse either, so we are planning ahead. Is there things that we could have done uh, sooner? I don't, you know, I think we've been acting responsibly. Well, I, I, don't, I think my question was, is there a committee or a pool of people that really step back and look at the what ifs in three or four years so that we don't get to crisis mode or did, you know what I mean? Because also I feel like we're in crisis mode. So is there, what you're telling me, what, what you're saying is there hasn't been that committee or foresight that you are now working towards to try to make it now that we're, it's been a long, we knew it was going to be an issue, but we just haven't been able to get it off the ground in order to figure out how to address a financial situation before it becomes a crisis mode at this point. We're, you're working on that, but that didn't happen five years ago or six years ago when we knew the numbers were going down, no one knew that. No, we've been, hey, working, that. we've been working on it as, as a board and as a, as a community, but I'll let other board members uh, speak uh, speak to these because it's not like we have, there's been a finance committee working in the long-term plan. So I can just jump just, in structurally. Yeah. I think the board is the, the board is the entity who has to answer the question of why they choose to take the actions they choose. But yeah. structurally, yes, these, we have known for, I would say, between six and 10 years that our enrollment has declined and um, have had conversations. So um, yes, there is a finance committee. The finance committee interacts with the board. They look at these numbers. They, there is an ability to project year to year. I would say it was, would have been difficult to project exactly the perfect storm that happened this year. That is a little bit different. But in terms of the, the big picture pieces, yes, there, is, there are structures to do that. And the board makes the decision that they make based on input they receive from the community. And um, so that's, 
again, my job is to create the structures. I don't know if board members would have anything to add to that. Where's that? I was going to say, we, we've talked about the numbers through several budgeting cycles. I don't know if any of you were here last year or the year before when we did talk about our declining enrollment. So it is a subject that the board has been discussing. But we also know that the physical configuration of our district can make the cuts that we need to make difficult. And that is a big change that takes time and needs a lot of community input and a lot of community engagement from us to you and you to us so that we can make meaningful change that benefits our students and it just, it takes time. So it sounds like you guys are just focusing on that one solution is gonna be X and that's what you guys are driving for versus stepping back like where else can we like maneuver stuff and cut things or whatever so we're not in such a tight thing that you're looking at combining no. or. That, I, think no, I can speak no. to that one. Yeah. So what the administration has said to the board at least in the two years that I've been here is further cuts in our current configuration would impact student programming. So yes, there is a deep look at all of the different functional areas and how we could get by, but at the end of the day, right now, we operate six schools, five elementary schools and a middle high school, and in order to do that effectively and not further sacrifice Students. instruction, what we have shared with the board is this is what it costs to run our current configuration, which is why the board is engaged in that configuration work. And it, it, I think it's important to note that sort of one of the things that the, the specific pieces of guidance on the configuration was to look at, you know, how how do we operate with fewer than five elementary schools? And so I think that's the that's the piece that's been going on for a couple of years. <clears throat> that's the real that sort of is you know we're we're going to have your really it's unfortunate the time is unfortunate but we're going to have sort of really concrete proposals, um, you know, to to look at you know in the next couple of months. But in the next few years, until that's done, we're going to have hits of 25% increase of taxes and stuff that we're just going to have to hit until we figure out how to make this thing level out a little bit. Yeah, it's definitely this year is extraordinary, Jane. The, we were not expecting it to be to be this. Yeah, we we knew that it was going to be bad. We knew that a fiscal cliff was coming. We were working towards that. We could have never predicted the perfect storm of all of this. And I, I also want us to acknowledge that. Like we said, there's there's other factors that we have absolutely no control over. But I want to give out some space for people online. Do you have a question there that we can? Well, I we do. We don't control the common level appraisal, and that has a significant impact yeah. on what the overall tax rate, the town's impact. I think it's the towns that mm -hmm. control the uh, common level appraisal. So if that was kept more up to date, mm -hmm. we wouldn't be seeing the spike that we have now. Um, but we would have a spike. I mean, to be. I mean, what is this person about 60, 65% of our overall costs? 80. 80. 80. So personnel is 80% of our costs. So you can close the building, but unless you're losing personnel at the same time, you're not really changing much in terms of the financial dynamics. Uh, so, you know, we have a choice here as a community. It's really where do we want to go with our educational program. Uh, and education is just more expensive now uh, than it was years ago. I, I'd say even 10 years ago because technology is constantly changing, it's always being updated, and it's just, it's hard. And it's just very hard uh, to give the type of quality education that our community expects, if not demands, uh, and also be fiscally frugal um, because they, they don't meet really well. Okay? I mean, we, we, really, we do really try, I will tell you that, because we're all community members here, and you know, but we have an exemption because our taxes won't go up this year. I'm just kidding. Um, but we all, we all, we all have the same funding problems that, that yeah. you guys in the audience do. So there's a question online. Um, why did you consider the federal funding that was given during COVID permanent and budgeted as though, as though it was coming from year to year versus just temporary and not added to the budget? Um, I, I can just start process-wise. I can tell you that most school districts in Vermont um, have did use ESSER funding to support staff, um, and that makes it a really difficult conversation to reduce. I would also say that um, administration looked closely at of those positions, which did they believe were necessary to maintain, and which did they believe 
were not necessary to maintain, and in some cases did not maintain them. Some of those reductions that you saw in the presentation um, were reductions of ESSER positions. In fact, the, the bulk of our reductions, our commensurate did not quite hit, that is true, the um, total amount we received, but they did come from the reduction of ESSER funds. Um, the board did make a decision uh, in January to preserve a couple of the positions because of their commitment to having um, full-time nurses and counselors at our smallest schools. Um, so that's that question. We can go back to the public here. Edie, were you going to? Any other questions? You had a question before, Edie? Uh, I don't need to ask Yeah. Nobody else? Go ahead. Are you still asking questions? Questions. 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 Okay. There's one more question that I was going to type in the chat um, because it's a it's a, how many students currently attend U32, um, and that number is 708. Yeah. So someone just asked a really specific question. Okay, there's no more questions. I'm just going to check here because I think that somebody did a direct message. Just want to make sure that is. Let's see, I think it's a comment. Oh no, it's a quite, I don't know. It, this is from Alan Gilbert and Lila Richardson. I was surprised to see on this year's budget article that there are there was no longer a per pupil spending amount given. So I dug into the data that has been provided and discovered there is a per pupil amount, but what is that call has changed? We just talked about that. And the new amount is more than 8,000 lower than the current spending per pupil amount. What happened? The per pupil spending amount was as us a useful number that accurately reflected how much school taxes would be. That system has now been eliminated. I worry that it is going to make it even harder for people to understand the school budget. Yeah, but I guess I would just echo. I think that's more of a comment than a question. Yeah. And, I, and I think what um, what I would say is that yes, because of the changes made to the funding system, the decisions that the board makes around what we spend here have become further disconnected from the taxes they actually pay. Chris talked about common level of appraisal is one reason, but how we count students is part of that. And so I'm not, again, I don't, there's not a question there, it's a comment, but I would just acknowledge. The other thing, just really functionally, there was a law in Vermont that was repealed last year. It was actually repealed just before we, pat, we uh, warned our budget last year that used to require that per pupil um, number to be included on the warning, and that law no longer, that was take it passed a law year. to take that requirement away, which is why it's not on the warning. And part of the reason they did that is because it is confusing. It's, it's, a, it's a different number because of the weighted pupil than, than the number of just what have our expenses increased year to year. So just kind of acknowledging that. Let me see. So you can go ahead. You this have a is question. A simple question. Do yeah. I understand correctly that we have benefited from the way that Yes. Yeah. We have benefited. Yes. yes. We have benefited. And do we, a uh, separate question, do we know how our, our, oh, no, let me start again, our CLAs have, are disgraceful right now in yeah. all of the towns. Yes. I thought there was a law that you couldn't go below 75% or something like that. Eight, anyway, eight, eight, eight. but do we know what percent of the, these total increases that range from 20, from 15 to 26 percent per time, how much of that is due to the, the CLA? So can we take that out of the equation and see how much is due to simply spending? Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, we can. 16 percent increase in spending. Yeah. Yeah, we can work a little bit of that, but you know, but also Edie, the the total amount they yield, it, how they set the yield, also affects the tax uh, the tax rate. So once the which is you know they just give so it's a guess estimate. It's the best estimate we have right now is February February eighth, and I think the other thing worth mentioning is that there is not affordable housing, and I know that this is a stretch, but there's not enough affordable housing and housing in the state as a whole which also makes it really impossible for the appraisals to stay. Well, because we're selling houses really expensive. So she's working on that number. Well, 
enough to. Is that, is that number I'm looking at 32 of this thing. The local educational spending. Hold on, give us a chance. Does that represent? And that's, that's up 16%. So that's the, the ed spending number, that, so the, the net after the revenues is increasing that much. I think what your original question was, before the CLA, how much is the tax rate increasing? So that equalized tax rate uh, is going up 6.06% .06 before the CLA application. So depending on which town you're in, like Berlin, it's a 19% a uh, impact Just from the CLA. Of the CLA. CLA. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So how do you get the towns to start doing appraisals? So the or law does require that they do an appraisal once they hit at or below 80%. The problem is that there's a real lack of appraisers in the state. So it's not a real simple thing for the towns to go out and, and say do this. And some of them looked at it, I think Berlin even looked at it when they were above 100%. They thought about redoing it, but they were like, we don't need to until we're at 80, and then all of a sudden it plummets two years later. So we're engaging an appraiser yeah. in that timely fashion actually takes a couple of years. So, so, so a lot of them are, are under pressure. This issue. Yes. this issue will be going on for a couple of years before any of your appraisals are done. Whether or not you will see that kind of decrease, um, the CLA is representative of sales from two years ago. So next year will be based on this year's. So if you're, you're your sales continue to drop, that CLA will continue to drop. And so there's another have... question online, If so it will, yeah. I'll just alternate. This one I think is quick. And the question is, is there any reason to delay a vote on the budget in case the legislature makes a different decision? But the board, you made this decision last, last week, two last weeks ago? Two weeks. So yeah. I don't know if you want to speak to <clears throat> why you, yeah. why you made I, the decision not to re-vote. Yeah, so basically we, we, we looked at a table of pros and cons as a, as, as a board and three of the major reasons we decided not to move the boat was to not have more confusion that we already had. The redoing the budget at this point wouldn't be, wouldn't allow us to have a system to reducing, to reduce stuff. It takes, it takes, we, we want to make just like what we're doing with the configuration committee and what we were doing with the strategic plan. If we're going to reduce, let's not just reduce for reducing, right? We don't want to affect how kids, the only place that we can reduce is staff. So what do, what do we say? We've been looking at this. Did, did you get that number of the 87%? I'm going to throw that right now if you have it. So for example, well, if the budget, yeah. yeah. Or should I wait? We, I think you should wait because okay. we've got several other questions. But so, but so, so those, were, were, those, were, those were two of the reasons. The other reason was that the tax impact was not that much different. We did a post on Front Porch Forum of, of this and so that you could compare the one that we approved on January 17 with the one that we approved right now on February 17 to 21st. I'm forgetting my dates right now. But there was not a huge difference in between, in, in between the, the two. So it didn't make, we, we would have to make an astronomic cut in order to make significant difference in the tax rate, which the only way to do that is by reducing staff. And so the fourth reason would be that we were also worried about, you know, creating chaos and instability on the mental health of our own employees and, and, and it's our same community members, right? We're all made of the same community members that teach here. That So do we, you know, we have to have contracts out on April 15. It, so there's a lot of place, pieces in place. And if the vote, it, you know, if the vote failed, it would give us more time in a weird way to be able to put a vote faster. The, if we decided to delay, we still needed to warn the budget 30 days, which meant that we needed to have everything ready by March 14th in order to vote the last day on April 15th. So it's just, it was just not realistic to, you know, to have this last minute throw it to you and then make, make a change that is not a system change, that is not really thought through. So that's why I, I, board members can add to that. <laughs> I just want to add one technical piece there because I think there's one, there's one statement there that is probably really confusing, which is that the, with, with, with the change in the law and the loss of the 5% cap, the tax rate didn't change that much. And the reason for that is that the cap applied, that things go in a certain order, and the cap applied before the CLA was applied. 
And so because so much of the increase is coming from the CLA, we actually didn't see a really big change from losing that's that. That's yeah. Thank you. That's right there. Um, okay, any other questions? I suggest that we take some questions because this gentleman's been waiting to make oh, a yeah. comment for a long time. No, so yeah, wait, before wait. we move to comments though, Chris, we have to make sure everyone's got all the information they have and then the comment is sort of like to yeah. round it okay. out. And yeah. there are definitely more questions on this end, so I, that's kind of why we're going yeah. back and forth. Okay, so so, can we okay? stick to the questions? Yeah, yeah. so Chris, just okay. yes, my neighbor and he'll be okay. Yeah. Yeah. Are there other questions, questions on this end? Questions on this end? Okay, there was one more here. No, there's two more. There's two several more, more okay. actually. So. Uh, at least two. So one of them, one of the questions is just in general uh, about income sensitivity. Um, and so I, I will start this. Uh, Suzanne can refine it and others can jump in. But um, in general, I, what I would just say in an overarching way is um, this coming year's income, so income sensitivity is based on the previous year. So even those who pay pr taxes based on income sensitivity will still feel this increase because of the timing of it. And that's a really important thing. It's not a full protection this year. Um, and then the rest of the question is, um, is there a way folks can get a sense of what their actual tax will tax bill will be after that adjustment before we vote on the budget and unfortunately that is not something that's that's the challenge of Our budgeting <laughs> in Vermont's education funding system is the is that disconnect and timing because essentially the tax rate is dependent on what happens on budget vote day and that is when people get a better sense yes we give you projections and we do the best that we can. And in fact, that's part of why some of the budget materials were later than normal, because we knew that property yield was so volatile that we held on to it for as long as we could. Um, so that is an imperfect answer, but that is the answer to that question. Uh, the next one is a comment. And and yeah, so Diane, board member, just talked about sharing resources for income sensitivity. We certainly could um, post that on our website and social media afterwards. Okay. So that may be it right. for questions. So go, go ahead, comments. comment. Go ahead. Okay. Do you want to introduce yourself for the, I know you, but. Uh, Richard Roberta, C. Stop here. Um, so I have to say, from where I'm standing, a lot of this uh, discussion in terms of sustain financial sustainability I think has very little credibility. I mean, we've known that the number of students is going down for years. And in the years since this unified union district was formed, as far as I can tell, the board has not made any significant changes to address the the increasing costs on fewer pupils, not just per pupil spending going up, but total spending going up with fewer and fewer pupils. And I know you make a big deal about the $700,000 that you took out of the budget this time. Well, $700,000 out of 44 million is one and a half percent. Meanwhile, spending is going up 16%. So you shouldn't be too proud of that, okay? That's just tinkering at the edges. Um, so in your, your actual commitment to making the district financially sustainable, to me, is questionable. I mean, you're asking for us to pay 25% more in taxes, and what are you offering in return? You're offering more talk, okay? You've been having this conversation about sustainability, financial sustainability, for years, okay? The kicker here is that a year from now, this 25% increase is gonna be the new baseline. It's gonna be the new normal. And your additional costs are gonna go be built on top of that. We're gonna be paying that 25% forever, okay? And like I say, I am really doubtful that you're going to take this seriously until people start rejecting the budgets. 
I mean, I think that's the only thing that's going to actually cause anything to change. So that's my comment. Thank you, Richard. I will read one from the screen. I don't have hands raised yet. You, you comment. Oh, sorry. Just, yeah. Board can respond. Sorry, I didn't mean to just, jump in. Well, I just right. wanted to jump to both of you. I, I hear your impatience with this process, and I guess I would um, encourage a little bit more patience. Uh, I mean, uh, the, the consolidation happened less than 10 years ago, and um, there that was a you know, tough thing for the towns to agree upon, and there was a lot of fear related to consolidation and what that might mean for the individual schools within our district. Um, so I think I was not on the board at the time, but I think wisely no rash decisions were made um, in the beginning. And then we were hit with a pandemic, which threw us into crisis mode for multiple years. And in the wake of that pandemic, a mental health pandemic. <laughs> um, and I, I totally, I'm not making, I, maybe I am making excuses, I guess, but it's, we are taking these solid steps with the reconfiguration committee and the strategic planning, and we are trying now to really thoughtfully look long-term within the district. Um, I just think it's been a, extraordinary journey in the past eight years or so. So I, I guess I would ask for some patience <laughs> and, and know that we are working and projecting ahead to the future as best we can. Anybody else? I would um, also just like to thank you for your comments and I would encourage folks who share this opinion um, to show up more to the meetings. Um, it should, it's helpful for the board to hear a diversity of opinion during the uh, initial stages of the budget process. So, thank you. Thank you. Okay, sorry Another. for jumping the gun. I'm gonna read one and then go back if that's okay. Yeah. Um, comment, uh, I'm just going to read it directly, and there's more than one, so I'll keep bouncing, but um, if you consider budgeting based on our housing appraisal and feel that the appraisal hasn't kept up with the current rate of market value, you must realize that the people owning those homes, houses, may not be able to buy them at their current appraised value, yet we are taxed as though our income would allow us to afford this house. The reality of increasing our taxes creates a situation where the owners of the house cannot afford the new taxes and new individuals who make enough to buy the hired, higher valued house move in. If you're trying to support our community, it will work against keeping people in their homes. I am considering moving with a $1,100 increase in my taxes. You'll slowly lose the community around you that you say you value. Thank you. Charlie. Any more comments from this side? Edie? I think when we formed this union, was it 10 years ago? I Five. I think it was, yeah, it was 2019. I was just looking it up. Yeah. yeah. I think we knew when the, difficult, the difficulties were going to be, and we recognized that there were, there were benefits to consolidation, both for financial. I, I never, personally never thought that we would save money, but I thought that it would be educationally better for our kids. To, to be able to have a consolidated district and have the restructuring opportunities that I think you're considering now. So I would just, I, I absolutely understand the difficulty of your position. Your, the, our small schools are our communities. I've lived here for a long, most of my long life and I am very acutely aware of how central our, our schools are to our communities. But I think when we did the consolidation, we decided that our kids' educations are important. You mentioned making that, um, uh, was it the Doty School, and the, 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 the combination of the pre-K and K has gotten to the point where you must consolidate. And that's, what is, that's what's coming. So um, despite the, I mean, not despite, but 
point of looking at the financial aid that 80% of our costs are, are um, staff, not buildings. But the, the buildings allow you to decrease the staff. Decreasing the buildings allows you to decrease the staff. So we know that's what's got to happen. And I, I, I'm getting a little long-winded here, but I, my message is simply you've got to get at this quickly because it has been the five years and you have needed time. People have to get used to thinking that um, I, my school that I love and has been here for 200 years is, is going to be different. It's either not going to exist, might get to go to some place that's better for them, or it'll exist in a different confirmation. But the time is of the essence now. I don't know that whether you could have done it any quicker or not, but it's inevitable, and you've always known that. And I think, you know, we are in crisis mode now, and um, I don't know what's going to happen with the vote, but I think it, it may be, um, it may push things, but but don't tar don't tarry. You have a terribly difficult job, and um, what I would hate to see is for our communities to lose the trust that we've always had in you. And I I have not lost the trust, but I I want to say get to it, get to it, because the hard decisions have to be made, and they are hard. They're terribly hard. Thank you, Penny. Go ahead. Just, this is just a procedural comment, but I've been struggling to try to hear specifically what you're saying, Floor. Uh, if your voice is soft enough that I'm having trouble, and I don't know if it would be good to have a microphone in the future. Yes, absolutely. We, uh, we often have one, and I apologize. We should have thought about it that tonight. I didn't think about it. But yeah. Thanks, Don. I have one other brief comment on Come the screen. As long as the board. Yeah, go ahead. But oh, you, you have to respond. To yeah. I have a comment, yeah. Sure. Uh, from Ann and Larry Gilbert, you guys have a tough job. Thanks for doing all you do. Thank so you. I, I, mean, I want to echo uh, Edie's comment about the um, value of our small schools in our small towns. Um, each one, in my view, serves as a community center, as a melding for the community because, you know, when we moved to town, uh, we met most of the Middlesex folks through uh, Romney School. And uh, this configuration will probably result in a school being closed. I mean, I, I don't see a way around that really. Um, and when that happens, that's a hardship for the town um, because uh, people don't want to send, they necessarily have their student bust. Uh, to another community, even if it's Rumney, six miles away, or it's Callis or East Montpelier, um, which is longer away, but they don't want to have their kids bust anywhere. Um, so, and and the the social center that he talked about um, is eliminated. It's not. It can be revived maybe in other ways, <coughs> but it's not as certain a social center as having your kids at school where they meet other kids and you meet other parents. Uh, through school meetings there, and you know that that is a, a lot to bear um, for a town, and it's it's a very difficult thing that we're going to be d doing. And I don't, I, I bet no towns are volunteering to have their school closed, uh, and you know none. And and the configuration could close any number of schools, but I think we'll do the best we can to minimize the harm. Uh, and do it for our students. Even though we personally may disagree with that is, um, but ultimately I think that will be the focus. Um, but the community, having a vibrant community is also what's best for the students that live there because they'll continue to live in that, that town. So those are, those are the pressures. So I, I think that kind of concludes the comments and the questions. So I, you know, if there were any, Mr. Dwayne. Thanks. Uh, this is just a procedural Can you introduce request. yourself? Pardon me? Can you introduce yourself? Because I know you, but not, I don't yeah. know if everybody else. Michael Duane from East Montpelier. This is just a procedural question. Yes. From a governance walk. Yes. I mm -hmm. noticed signing in on the sign-up sheet. And I noticed on many of the materials in preparation for this meeting, this is being called an annual meeting. Yes. Th th this is not the annual meeting. The annual meeting is tomorrow from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. This is the required informational public hearing prior to a vote <coughs> by Australian ballot. 
So this is not the district's annual meeting. That's tomorrow at each polling place from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m., except for Berlin, which is 10 o'clock. This is a public information hearing. So I would suggest we not use the term annual meeting to describe this gap. Thanks. I do have one more. Question. It's an Act 46. Yeah, there's, okay. there's one more question. It, it, one more comment. Comment. <laughs> Edie, you had one more thing. I just wanted to um, uh, comment on Chrissy's and and Michael's comment just now. Part of the restructuring of the the, the initial government restructuring and now as you get into school recess. Structuring. I hope we, you will all, we all will consider how to create a new community, mm -hmm. which is a five-town community. And part of that may be having an annual meeting, or at, or at least a big, like we used to have years ago, a big pre-town, a pre-school meeting, where people really came and debated. Uh, so we have to have new ways as we're losing some of us may lose our schools as a community center. I mean, physically they can still be used that way, but we have to find ways as a five town community to build community and to, to, to rave about our kids, to be proud of our kids. And um, that's, that's easy, much easier said than done, but I think it will be a worthwhile effort I absolutely agree, Edie. I think as a board, we've been talking a lot about having a larger sense of community, right? That it just, all our kids, I think there's a complete understanding now on this board that all our kids are our kids. And now creating that larger sense of community, right? Like, you know, Worcester is our community regardless if they're, I'm picking on McKellen right now, like regardless if there is a school there that is an elementary school or is there, you know, if that building is used differently. Worcester community still is part of, you know, this is their school. You know, this is, our family is the five towns and as board members we're committed to, to that, but I agree that we have to have that larger sense of community. There's one more, it, go ahead, Amelia. It's worth saying, um, prior to the reconfiguration study, we did an exercise as a board with the Great Schools Partnership uh, facilitator. And part of that brainstorming exercise was to consider how we might repurpose the buildings as community centers and to help kind of solidify that cohesiveness of community in those <coughs> local areas. Um, and I really appreciate your comment and, and um, your input, Edie. Thank you. And I wish you well. You're very yeah, difficult. But I think you're up to it. Just do it. Get to it. <laughs> yeah, so we have one more yeah, online ahead. comment, and then I'm sorry. Um, so the comments from Becca Mandel. Um, I think it's useful to remember that we are talking about the kids who live in our communities and that investing in them saves taxpayer money down the road. I believe that nationally every dollar invested in public education saves seven dollars down the road, so this investment is prudent. Most of us pay our education taxes based on income, but the highest income earners don't. Their high income makes it so they pay based on their property values, so low and middle income taxpayers end up paying a heavier burden than the wealthiest among us. We are working with an imperfect system and we need to fix the reality that the wealthy, wealthiest among us pay a smaller portion of their income to support our schools than those of us in the middle or working class. Once we do that, the cost of funding education for our kids will be more fairly distributed. Right now, before we get that fixed, this is indeed a challenge, but it's not the kids who should suffer for the fact that we haven't fixed our system. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, Introduce yourself. For oh, yeah, I'm Lee Garrity from Thanks. Worcester. Yeah. Um, we've known for years and years, as you guys said, that the population was going down here. Um, and I think it's really easy to get frustrated that something wasn't done more proactively as a result of that. But when I hear that the consolidation happened, is it really just five years ago? Yeah. And then COVID hit, which I don't know if you guys remember back at the beginning of COVID, but nobody knew what the heck was going on, let alone school personnel. I think that, um, and then you get into the mental health ramifications of that, and then you get into the fiscal, uh, 
crisis that we're in now. I mean, we have been in crisis mode for a while, but I don't think it's because anybody sort of dropped the ball early on. I think it's just the way that it's been. And I would just like to say that I think that you have done a really good job educationally and personally over those crises, um, keeping the best interest of the kids and your school personnel in mind. And here we are, and hopefully we can um, go forward and you can have a lot of input. But I just wanted to say that I think it's easy to kind of forget about COVID and the impacts and, and want to move on. I see that in a lot of facets of life, but I think it's important to just remember that there are reasons why things are the way they are right now, and not only because people aren't doing their share. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any more? Okay. With that, we conclude our meeting tonight. Thank you very much thank for you. coming. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Feel free to make all <coughs> those questions and get to know your board members. Thank you.